Hi everybody, welcome to August Crafty Crows. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Josephine Lay. Uh, I used to be here an awful lot, just recently not so much, but it's lovely to be back in the host's chair, especially as tonight we've got the fabulous uh, Sue Finch with her new book, um, I should remember it, and I welcome to the Museum of a Life. <laughs> Um, just before we start, a few very brief housekeeping um, notes. Uh, please mute for each poet. You can unmute and clap after they've read. This event is being recorded, so please only share poems that you're happy to class as being published. Open mic poets, please keep to your three minute slot as we have quite a few poets to get through tonight. Please use the chat to share your bios, books and events. And finally, the GPS is a volunteer-led society, so please spare a donation if you can, or consider joining with a society membership. So with that out the way, um, I'm going to start us off in a moment with a poem, um, but we've got a lot of lovely people on the open mic tonight. Um, So I've been sort of scribbling. I can't say that these are finished poems, but uh, they're sort of first drafts. And this one's called Earth Works. As a child, I hugged the grass on hills or by the dip and curve of Iron Age forts. I'd stretch full length, roll the slope, landing dizzy, in the lap of meadow. Now tall in my vertical stance, feet encased in shoes, body clothed, I've lost the touch of skin on Earth's epidermis. I see the grass as Gaia's hair, of rock as her skeleton. She has no arms with which to hug, but she hurts when we cut her flesh, when we excavate her bone. Bleeding no blood, shedding no tear, she still groans at our lack of love. <laughs> okay, well, we'll get straight on with um, our first of the open mic. And the very first is Michael Sindler. Welcome, Michael. Hey, always such a treat to be here. Um, I'm going to start with one that was written for a very dear friend who just passed away. He was 82, so he lived a nice full life, so it's not tragic, but... Uh, Still wanted to do an elegy for him. It's called Bill. Dessert first is familiar motto, resonant with chosen joy. Kuan Yin, invisible on shoulder, compassion wafting like cologne, laugh reverberating in time with surrounding heartbeats, centered souls following wide smile into fellowship. Lanky frame, leaning back, bony knees tucked under table, paper-plated macrobiotic meal and peach pie slice appetizer. Plastic fork looks puny and long, knotty, knuckled fingers. Moment never rushed. Elder hewn and polished joke, glowing golden story spun, or good ear given to carefully listen surest sign of a true friend. Day after day after day, anticipated return, always a delight. And this next one is um, unfortunately a little different. It's uh, a friend who I'd lost track of for many years and then found out that they had passed and uh, so it's kind of like losing somebody twice. So it's called ghosting. 
Isn't a ghost supposed to stay close? Why does ghosting demand distance? Hunt for clues on memory-stained and heart-wiped mirrorless surfaces? Rough gray blocks cold as solitude, silent as your absent semblance. Climbing and descending remembrances stairs, futile searching for the stone that friendship slipped on. Familiar film of fog opaque enough to obscure location and intent, like tie-dyed sheet and doorframe awaiting silhouette shadow. Absence of recalled sound is worst. Soft, ever-halting voice stilled, still keeping digits in directory in hopes of 4G necromancy. To be spectator at slightest glimpse of specter would make years of searching seem worthwhile, but no apparition is arriving and hope has faded into phantom emotion. Not being haunted leaves you free to haunt yourself. Time to turn back to what does not hide. And I would do one that's a little bit more positive, but I think I've used up my three minutes. So. Yeah, thank you, Michael. They were beautiful. Um, interesting. Um, the stone that friendship slipped on, and that's something that Beth's picked out too. Beautiful phrases in there. Lovely. Big round of applause for Michael Singer. Okay. We'll carry on with Doc Channing. Doc. I can't see you, but I'm sure you're still there. Ah, oh, there you I'm be. here. I am here. Welcome. <laughs> just, just look for the dragonfly. This poem is based on a saying by Osho, a 20th century a mystic. The title is Penetration. Physical penetration, sex, is superficial at best. Emotional penetration. Love is deeper, more significant, and human. Consciousness penetration, empathy, is the meeting and melding of our souls, for we are souls which have bodies. And I wrote this after being in a park one day, pocket of time. I listened to water rippling through a nearby creek on its eternal journey through cycles of time and life. The sun slowly recedes from the sky, its blue deepening. The air in this small pocket of time cools. It is early evening. Life begins to slow. A quartet of young deer appear on the sward, then disappear into the recesses of nature. Quiet begins to unfold me. Night begins its quickening. Birds sing their even songs into the fading day. And peace flows from the hillsides around me. Thank you. Beautiful, Doc. Really beautiful. Thank you so much for those poems. Lovely. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Stacy Dyson. Welcome, Stacy. Thank you. In honor of Sonia Massey. The tears don't help you work. They blur the screen leave you trying to scrub wet salt and horror off your hands. Recreate, reinvent the memory of every other pain you've tried to write away your voice gets hoarse. Your instrument becomes your torment because you can't cry. It strangles the syllables. You can't breathe shallow. You need the air in your passages to tell the truth. And anyway, what good does it do? Your sisters still get shot for going about their lives for no good reason, going about their lives. 
I am tired of writing poems, mourning Black women who are just minding their own damned business. You read the reports and your eyes begin to burn and there is no use in crying. Crying doesn't stop bullets. Crying doesn't stop insanity. Crying doesn't stop the threat of being murdered for playing games with children, smoking a cigarette, boiling water, sleeping. But you have to know. You have to read the reports and watch the videos and suffer. You have to feel like the weight of a thousand years is never going to be off your shoulders because their names need to be said at least once in celebration of their lives, just once. In celebration of their lives, not as martyr or icon or the reason for a revolution, just spoken as person, as people, as women just trying to make a way, make it through, live, as person, live without the threat of becoming the focus of a movement, but your eyes burn and you rebuke yourself, run to your pen, try and make it right the only way you know how. Try to make it right the only way left to you. Try to not tremble while you write the piece, sing the piece, your eyes are burning, but you can't cry, don't. Cry, not where anyone can see you. Remind yourself, this has happened before. You know the drill, why are you surprised? Remind yourself, this has happened before. You can't, you can't give up. You can't give up the right, the right to be surprised and hurt and desperate, so hurt, so exhausted, so desperate because someone has to sing all their song. Someone has to mix the pain, anger, salt sweat streaming, utter betrayal produced by this country into ink that breeds firestorms. Because the tears alone, the tears don't help you do the work. Whoa, that was so powerful. And the thought that you have to celebrate each and every person's name, every woman's name, that was really powerful. Thank you so much, Stacey Dyson. Please, a big round of applause for Stacey Dyson. Okay, next up is Ed Poetess. Potastic. I can never say this properly. Hi, Ed. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being so enthusiastic and fantastic. Your word is so bombastic. Hello, my name is Ed Potastic. I'm feeling fantastic. Please, in time, you can join my Ryan Fopo Sublime. I got two short pieces, so I won't take too much time. My first piece is from our wonderful Mike Sanders workshop. Um, I told him words. This is called Green in Need. I can't live out poetry. It's words inside you and me. I don't need anything else, maybe insight or a belt. I'm not a collector of wealth. I play the cards I've been dealt. I remember I was poor. It balanced my red core. I ate some collectors. Fight and take to feel even better. You pay how much for those shoes? Did you get at least a trip or a cruise? You pay how much for that dress? Are you that eager to quickly impress? You pay how much for that car? That Tesla isn't going to take you far. You pay how much for that ring? Did they at least give you golden wings? You pay how much for that art? Where's your condominary go-kart? You pay how much for that your mate? With or minus the one time only estate. Where are the monsters we feed? Buy whatever you want, but please some humanity. The less fortunate need money too, for a plate of stew or to warn off the flu. Thank you. And this is a tribute to one of my dearest friends. He was a brother. He died a year ago from um, pancreatic cancer. No, he died from um, colon cancer. This is called Silent Whispers. Life isn't the same. You are the flame. Events took you away. There goes the days. 
You are buried right under, while we cry like thunder. You have a unique heart that shine like quality art. I know you are here and there. I know you still share with care. Sometimes I wish it was me. I know you whack away the misery. Your tombstone still stands, the legend that grazed the land. I dream of you every night to remember your sight. That it can bring you back, but you will never fade to black. I remember you as you are, the brightest thing close to a star. I'm glad you're taking a peaceful rest inside the ground and my chest. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Ed. Thanks very much. Thanks to everyone who is sharing, you know, pain of people that they've lost. It's very important to keep them alive in your hearts. So a big round of applause for Ed Pertestic. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, next up is Adam Elms. Adam, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, my first time here. Um, Doubly very welcome. Happy, very happy to be here. Uh, wonderful poem so far. I'm I'm going to share a poem that um, won the Waltham Forest Prize last year uh, because I haven't read it since for some reason. <laughs> um, and I suppose it is about it is about grief, really. Um, I'm not going to say any more. I'll just read it. Uh, this is called "The Last VHS Player in England." The last VHS player in England does not bite the trembling hand that feeds it, but hoovers up its nightly supper with a snapping jaw again. Greedy for memory, for that aftertaste of yesterday and yesterday and yesterday and yesterday and press play. Watch 1992 tickle its palate. A blinking, a blur, a whir stirs her into view. The picture quakes. Technicolor tries to shriek, but is clouded by a grainy shroud. Childish yelps crack wide the film as she whirls towards Grandad, hands waving, sundress mid-leap, chasing sobs from the garden hose, catching the beanbag and dropping the beanbag and throwing the beanbag and pause, rewind, stop, press play, catching the beanbag and dropping the beanbag and throwing the beanbag and pause, rewind, stop, too far, fast forward, stop, press play, catching the beanbag and dropping the beanbag and throwing the beanbag and Grandad does a silly voice and we giggle at her purple ice lolly tongue and she throws the beanbag at the cat and waves. The dopey panda still grinning from her velcroed shoes. And pause, rewind, stop, too far, fast forward, stop, too far, stop, rewind, press play. The last VHS player in England belches up its nightly supper with a weary jaw. Again. Thirty-one years ingesting the very same yesterday and yesterday and yesterday and yesterday and grief is a tang embedded in its taste buds, shuddering through its mechanical guts where she now lives for three minutes and forty-six seconds every single evening she is alive she's still alive press play press play she lives she still lives pause rewind stop 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 play press play look look there look she's waving again thank you Wow, that was really powerful, a brilliant way of showing grief and showing how you've tr captured someone beautifully done. Thank you. A big round of applause. Thank please, you, Adam. And I hope we'll see you here again. Thank you. Carol, Carol Shepherd. Hi, where are you? Hello. Hi, uh, you. Welcome. <laughs> thank you. Uh, the first poem I'm going to read is called Philosophile. I wake to voices floating across the harbour, 
clank of chains, soft chug of boats. No, before I open my eyes, you are gone. I miss you. I miss the way you held me in your arms last night, your soft kisses on my skin, how we melded together and it felt right. We clung to each other as anemones cling to rocks, begging the moon not to rise, the tide not to turn, melted into each other, danced as high-flung herring quiver silver in moonlight. How we lost our eyes like anglerfish, our limbs and muscles merged, your skin became my skin, our blood shared the same veins. Now in morning's wide yawn, the screech of the black-headed gull cries from my own strangled throat. My hand reaches and feels, feels the chill of the empty sheet. Your scent drifts away, a schooner chasing the waves. I knew that the sea would call you back, knew that I would lose you again. And then just a little short poem called Cobweb Love. Your filigree love was beautiful, fluttering in the breeze. You lingered, vibrations rippled. You caught me in fine spun silk, glistening with silver, dewdrop promises. You fooled me, words twisting in the wind, crystallizing in ice, until your well delicate web began to break, strand by fragile strand. I untangled myself from you, took flight again. Oh, thank you lovely thank you carol that was deliciously delicate that last poem beautiful please a big round of applause for carol shepherd <laughs> oh, gosh we're moving on quite fast let's see where am i again so the next one up is margaret margaret royal welcome Hello, <laughs> just busy writing. <laughs> okay, I'm going to read a couple of shortish ones. Um, I've got a couple of new books, so one from each. The first one is from Takata and Fugue with Harp. And it's looking back at my childhood and some of the things I found challenging and distressing. <clears throat> so this one is called Festival Stress. Music festivals, oh, what torture. Sleepless nights, nerves jangling, stomach churning. Whether piano or vocal, excuse me, <coughs> Whether piano or vocal pieces, it was the same. A compulsion to please parents and music teachers. Show them how good you are. You can knock Colin and Yvonne into a cocked hat, you know. They were the ones convinced of my talent. Me, I doubted their faith in me, tried to protest, but couldn't say no. Pressure to perform like a barrel organ monkey. Pressure to prove myself, make them proud. Whose triumph or failure would it be anyway? On reflection, no one ever asked me how I felt. And the second one is from uh, my latest little chapbook called Our Fetish, which is a fantasy about becoming an owl and the creatures I spend time in the woodland with. So this is one from the sequence. It's called Ascalaphus, who is a myth mythical owl creature. Ascalaphus. In my sleep, I drool matted feathers, shape shift into a creature of dark night. A swoop of trapeze in silent flight, startling as the jeweled pomp of a peacock's pride. I sharpen my talons, paint their surface with resined lacquer, 
a pearlescent shimmer, piercing the gloom. Like opal fire on a bride's finger, a diva preparing her entrance, shafting arrows of fear through fragile hearts. I attune my voice to the husky riff of a blues singer, honey-dripped baritone, perfect in pitch. As daylight descends, I retire to my cave, morphing into a Greek spirit of the underworld. I am a scalifus. Thank you. Brilliant. They're lovely, especially, I love that last one from the owls. Thank you very much, Margaret. Please, a big round of applause for Margaret Royal. And next up, we have Belinda, Belinda Rimmer. Welcome. Hi. I've got a couple of poems for my brothers, my little brothers. There have never been nights like these. Awake on his side of our room, my brother begs, one more, one more story. We burrow under blankets, listen for the bump, 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 as our parents climb the stairs. I, shh, shh, press a finger to my lips towel my tails in whispers. In the moon's light, I make a shadow angel with moving wings. We are nighttime children, fearful of morning. We are searchers of galaxies, rollers of paper cigarettes. When we grow too big for our shared room, the colors of darkness dim, the shadow angel falls away and the cigarettes we smoke are the real thing. And then this little one is called Brothers in Arms. My father always held my brothers, one on each arm, to raise them from the ground years after they'd grown to men. There was nothing of me back then but bone, yet he never held me dizzy and don't look down the way he held them, which seems to matter more now than it did then. Thank you. Oh, wow. Thank you, Belinda. They're beautiful. Do you know you're the ma mistress or master of last lines? I love it. Thank you so much. Please, big round of applause for Belinda Rimmer. And that brings us to the end of our first open mic. And so next, it's a great pleasure to introduce Sue Finch, which I'm sure most of you know. Um, Sue Finch is the author of two poetry collections published by Black Eyes, Magnifying Glass in 2020, and more recently, Welcome to the Museum of a Life in this last year. Her poems have appeared in a number of online magazines and have been featured on the poetry podcasts Eat the Storms and A Thousand Shades of Green. She loves the coast uh, and peculiar things like the scent of ice cream freezers. <laughs> Very strange. <laughs> but um, she lives with her wife, Kath, in North Wales. Um, and also she's done a little collection of, of um, Vortex Over the Wave was published in 2023. It's a selection of her elastic band poems, if you remember it. Um, and I just want to say this is her most recent book and it's brilliant. I'll just read a little bit of what um, Damien Donnelly put as a quote on the back of it. Ponds, pitfalls, pandemics, peacocks, pelicans, and funeral preparations. On view in Sue Finch's second collection is a kaleidoscope of memory, moments, fears, and desires, curated in a lyrical museum. Well worth seeing, well worth getting. So a big, big warm welcome to Sue Finch. That's really nice. Thank you. I love crafty crows. So to actually 
read here um, is is wonderful. And I love the open mics. The, the best thing about this group is the range of words. I just love it. So thank you for the immersion in that. Um, I'm excited. I'm a wee bit nervous because that's my default mode when I'm going to read. But I'm sure that's also OK in this friendly space. So I've put together a set. And the last time I put together a set, I was really proud of what I'd put together. I was going to read in a park at Pride. And then I looked on their social media and it said that there was story time for naught to five year olds in the library. And then why not come for family friendly poetry and hear Sue Finch? And I thought, oh dear, okay, I'm not sure all of my poetry is really family friendly. Um, my sister always says some of my poems make her go a bit, ooh. But I've got a family friendly one to start with, which is quite handy. So when I was little, I didn't eat my crusts and it was sort of okay until the day my mum was getting me a new bed. This one's called Answering My Mother. I'd meant to move them, remembered that I needed to move them. Then the day distracted me and bedtime was just for sleeping and a new day was for coming down and putting the television on. Not even when she went upstairs that morning did I think of it again. Until she shouted, I had totally forgotten. We could have had mice. My forgetful mind made my heart sink. The cry worsened. Rats, we could have had rats. The four flights of stairs between us only gave me time to swallow and stare. I had meant to move them. I had planned to wrap them in newspaper like chips, take the package quietly to the backyard, unclip the dustbin lid, lay it inside. Rats, we could have had rats. If you didn't want to eat them, that's okay. You didn't need to hide them under there. For months, I'd been pushing Sunday crusts under the bed. Too dry, too dark. I only liked soft buttered marmalade bites. I ate up to the edge, felt ungrateful for not eating the rest, so I slid them under the bed. If I'd have put them in the bin, she would have known my ingratitude. They're mouldy, the carpet's mouldy, the bed men are coming and we've got mould. We could have had rats. Why didn't you just bring them downstairs? My answer wouldn't come. So that's relatively family friendly. And then the one, oh, I'll do a bread poem. So in Magnifying Glass, um, there's sort of a story to this set list. I want to read you my bread museum because it follows on. At breakfast on the penultimate day, I used the sleeve of my freshly pressed shirt to smuggle a white roll from the buffet. So pale, so very soft like your cheeks. I centred it in my case on unworn socks. Retrieving it after a long, long flight, I grinned, relieved that it was still intact, and set it on my windowsill to dry. You tried to throw my souvenir away, told me it was useless and unfunny. Watching it harden, I wished that I would. Long after the removal van you hired had gone, I still kept it. New windowsill old exhibit. Dusting my strange ornament made me smile. I added to it often. Wheat freckled wholemeal baguette, mini white cottage loaf, rosemary and potato chia batter, a slice of one night stand extra thick white, steadily building my bread museum. And then this is the poem that I was going to open my set with at Pride, which I thought, well, it's got a few words in it that perhaps three and four year olds don't need to hear me read. It's called Museum of a Life. Exhibit A, the bath where she was made to wash by her first lover. Exhibit B, the shower where she was lime soaped by her second. Exhibit C, an unwritten postcard from home where she floated in the bay laughing with her third. 
Exhibit D, dinner plate of sliced tomatoes, kaleidoscoped with red onion rounds drizzled in olive oil. Photo, France. Exhibit E, white bread roll, origin, Las Vegas. Exhibit F, Barcelona street map, displayed here in the front pocket of the rucksack she wore against her breasts to minimise the risk from pickpockets. Exhibits G to I, the green carnation, the dropped pound coin, and the fucking hostile badge from the blind date with the woman who went on to become her wife. Exhibit J, the stars she couldn't believe she saw when she tipped the bucket chair back so much she fell and hit her head. Exhibit K, the missed beat from the intro to the first dance at her wedding. Exhibit L, 60 watt light bulb, previously inserted into her mouth while she pretended to be a lamp on a car journey back from Whitstable. Exhibit M, the orgasm she had while watching Wendy James from the edge of the stage, Hammersmith Odeon, 1989. Exhibit N, yellow sailing trousers and blue t-shirt from the Saturday night disco at Manchester Pride, year unrecorded. Exhibit O, the kitchen counter she lent on to tell her mum she was gay. Exhibit P, her mum, who already knew, who had done for years and wondered why she hadn't said it herself. Exhibit Q, snake bite and black from the bottom of her boots the night she danced with Chris's girlfriend. Exhibit R, two Dolly Parton backstage passes and associated meet and greet photos. Exhibit S, a jar of Smurfs. Exhibit T, Ronnie, cuddly toy and photogenic alter ego, purchased Chester Zoo, 2002. Exhibit U to V, black velvet smoking jacket and size 10 jeans. Exhibit W to Z, this space is reserved for future exhibits. So now it might set the context for this book, which I was very lucky to work on with Josephine. Um, it took a while to come up with the format for the book, but it is arranged in galleries. Um, I'm not really an exhibitionist, but you might uh, begin to think that I am by the time I've exhibited all of my life. So gallery one, for example, is a gallery of childhood. And it says in here that if you enter this gallery, you will see a dog blanket, a large homegrown tomato, a spade, a photograph of Fred the tortoise, a book open at the nursery rhyme, Ladybird, Ladybird, Fly Away Home, a shed window with spiderless cobwebs and a Ouija board. And I've chosen to read you the one that goes with a shed window with spiderless cobwebs. This one's called Pelting. The single thud thump that signaled death still sounds in my chest sometimes. A brown rabbit with unquestioning eyes being carried in on a rainy day. Stress makes tough meat, so hands as big as haunches stroke it to calm on the wooden bench. I swear there are whispered words of love as ears are folded back to reveal the soft white fur at the nape of the neck. As the stick is raised, I am held by the silence. Through the cobwebbed window, I still watch. Those eyes die within seconds. Then the back legs are tied. I cannot remember how long it hangs. How long before the blood stops dripping from the quiet nose. How long before fat fingers push in to separate pelt from flesh. I just know I hate the rip and the peel and the thought of those hands. Nice cheery one. <laughs> and I think I forget sometimes, I think Josephine did a little shudder when she read that one and just said, I need to think about um, making sure people know that I'm not family friendly really. So this one follows on really nicely. Uh, it's called Wolf. After the first day, she smelt blood all day. Even pacing for hours in the cold air would not let her lose it. 
The second time it was on her tongue and in her throat. Spoonfuls of cream would not carry it down. After the third, she learned to soap and irrigate her nostrils, her tongue, each of her fingerprints. She was ready to grip her own knife, to listen to the rip and slice of the wolf's belly. She imagined feeling the skin give way, the slit expand, that soft puff of warmth, the scent of his guts. Holding her breath, she pushed stone after stone inside, let her hands slip in the warm, thick red. The blood dried stiff on her hands before she sewed tight, criss-cross stitches to seal him dead. Boy, I think I even want a nice one now. Okay, we'll go to the world of... I loved my nan. Of all the people in the world, she was the one person who always said, there's only one of you. Um... And this is a love poem of grief for her. It's called I Don't Know. I don't know exactly how many seconds there were between your final two breaths. I don't know if anyone else in that room just thought we would be watching and waiting forever. I don't understand the impurity of mixed fruit jam. I can't know if you died hungry or thirsty, grateful or knowing. I don't know if biting one by one through a dozen budded tulips would help. I don't know if you really thought people come back as birds, or whether it was your way of keeping the dead alive, not having to say goodbye. I don't know how seasick you were on all those cruises you took for him. I don't know if someone has your bureau in their house, if it still smells of the tea and sugar you stashed inside for years. I can't know how cold you were with no heating. I don't know if always wearing a vest, a jumper and a cardigan helped. I don't know what it felt like when you undressed for bed. I know your cheeks were cold wax in the chapel of rest, that you looked peaceful and young and beautiful, that I wanted you then as a statue so I could keep you with me forever. Oh, here's a, a love poem. Uh, this one is for my wife. It's called That Coin. I imagine putting that pound coin in my mouth, tonguing it from heads to tails and back again. As you walked in, a clock somewhere struck eight, while the minute hand of the one I was dying clicked its 30th tick. Your hair... Your skirt, your makeup, your eyes straight ahead told me you were out of my league. Then that fumble of fingers had that coin falling from your grip. Your one floor was all I needed to say my name. Like a one out like a one-armed bandit on Triple Seven, I rattled out the stories of my life. And still you said yes to a coffee I wouldn't make, and paused on the bridge over the canal to kiss me. I could love that pound coin forever, take its metallic tang again and again. And sometimes I quite like to write from dreams, so there is a gallery of dreams in here. And I once dreamt about making, well, I saw a picture of a blade which was made of quartz. And then I dreamt, I think, that I made it from ice. So this one's called Blade. I fashioned a blade from ice, carved its purity with steel, ran with it to the circus tent. I raised it above my head so it flashed under the lights. The slow drip down my wrists reminded me this treasure was temporary, but I'd made this and the moment was mine. Too early for the ringmaster and clown to be in full costume, Braces dangling, cheeks pink, faces not yet settled. They breathed grass air and watched. Are you auditioning? Asked the ringmaster, breaking the enclosed silence. I felt sure I could pull something off, but wondered how I'd cope in those cold caravans. Was it time to see so much more of the world, or had I carved this beautiful dagger for a different purpose? I frowned thoughtfulness. Then, feet together, 
I lifted my melting weapon above my head. Neck back, I opened my mouth as wide as I could. Tasted yesterday's popcorn, tinged with hot dog, slid it slowly in. I'm 98% sure they applauded. That's a nice sound. This one comes from a dream. Um, and it's sort of, well, sometimes I think about this when I'm sitting at poetry readings and perhaps I shouldn't. It's called, last night I dreamt I slid my poems into drawers of disinfectant to sterilize their titles. Today, a poet in black stands at a lectern reading her words. At the end, she straightens her pages says she wants to sing for us. Shoulders back, she begins. Her eyes are closed as she sends out the song. I want to listen, but she is moving now. Her, the lectern and the music she is making rise into the air. I see no ropes, no pulleys, yet she is up beyond the curtain fringe. Then a slice of the stage drops open beneath her and I gasp as I see what is planned. Down into the trap room she goes. I wasn't sure her song fitted, or exactly what she was trying to say, but her poems had me clapping. I turn to you, realising I don't own her books or remember her name. No one in the audience seems the least perturbed. They are going for ice cream. Come on, you say. They've got three different vegan flavours. And then this poem is quite an apt one to end on. It's called When I Am Gone. Serve soul cakes. Sprinkle dried green lettuce on salty crackers. Plate up purple and orange macaroons. Yellow too, if it pleases you. Spear black olives onto cocktail sticks. Put out far too many bottles of red wine. Spend an hour of your morning cracking almonds into small bowls. Sweep up the debris with your hands. Let each fruit be a memory, but watch out for the bitter ones. Everything should fit mouths that are not hinged to be wide. Have potential to be slipped in nonchalantly between tales that bring out hard laughter. Except apples. They will let you watch for who bites right in, who takes a knife to them, who puts two in their bag for later. At the end, if a soul cake remains on that table, take it to the coast, await the interest of gulls, then toss it decidedly upwards. Let the cries fill the air. Brilliant, brilliant, Sue. Please unmute everybody and give Sue a fabulous round of applause. Woo! 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 It's been such a joy working with you on your poems. I love your poems. I could listen to them forever. Um, it was wonderful. I just want to put one little anecdote in there. The first poem you read, you wanted at the front of the book, didn't you? Oh, yes. Remember. And I was sitting there, I said, we've got one problem here. We're putting all these exhibits in cabinets for people to see. How do we exhibit an orgasm? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. we put it at the back of the book. <laughs> I think that, that poem's always going to be special, isn't it? It, did, yeah. it? it does a thing. It can't be read to four-year-olds. And it also gave me the book. So thank you. And thank you, everybody. Do you know what? That's like a little, that's the perfect goal for me to read for you all. So thank you it's been brilliant thank you once again brilliant too. and can we have a round of applause for all the open micers because you were all brilliant fabulous and that's the end of our first half so i think stop recording perhaps jason Okay, welcome back to the second half of Crafty Crows. That was a brilliant first half, and I'm sure the second half is going to be equally as good. 
I've just got a couple of announcements to make. Uh, Crafty Crow, Crow is on the 4th of September. will feature Gloucestershire poet Frank McMahon. Uh, the 2nd of October features Stacey Ardis Dyson in celebration of Black History Month in the UK. And we've just heard from Stacey, didn't we? So she's very powerful. And the 2nd of November features Nicholas McGorney and Finn Hall. So that should be brilliant. Um, if I can just add a couple of things here. First of all, our poetry competition uh, with GPS and Black Eyes has now finished. And at the moment, I am trawling through hundreds of poems. We've had a bigger um, response this year than more than ever. Um, which is brilliant, but it's also a lot of hard work. So, <laughs> And J Jason will be being pulled in in a little while uh, to help. Um, but it's been brilliant. So all of you who put in poems to help uh, raise funds for the GPS, because all profits go there. Thank you very much. Um, and I think that's probably everything. So I'm going to start again with just a couple of little poems. Um, so many in the first half were talking, uh, were, were reading poems um, of memorial, of um, celebration of people that they've lost and loved. And I just wanted to read a little tiny book, poem from um, a quietus. And I was very honoured when um, Claire Dyer asked me if she could use this on her father's order of service. Um, so that was really lovely. It's called Take Up the Newly Dead. Take up the newly dead, hold them close and carry them. For though they have left us, they are in need of love. Are fragile without skin, shapeless without bone and their breath is remembrance. So that's for all of those people that we've lost and loved. And this little one, again, I wrote it a little while ago. Um, I miss the sea. I don't often see it. You've got to realise that I grew up in the Isle of Wight, so I really miss the sea. And this was just something I scribbled about the sea. I have put the sea away, placed it between the pages of a heavy tome in my library of past memory. I have put the sea away, though I live on an island, but too far inland to hear the waves pounding the shore, the crying of gulls, the boom of storm. I have put the sea away, buried it deep beneath floorboards, I'm deaf to the sounds of ocean within shells, though it tugs at my heart like the tide. I have put the sea away in a box decorated with shells. I see signs, a pebble shining in the rain, the sign of a crab, the smell of salt and ozone as a storm rises, over hills that curve like the backs of a wave. I've put the sea away from my thoughts, but memory pools between the rocks of life, and I am wading through salt water. Yeah. Okay, so we'll now go on to our next open mic right one we haven't had any changes jason have we no okay just one just 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 one change uh, but I'll, I'll message that in the chat to you in a minute so. okay okay so we start off with gerald kells is he here oh yeah guys um and last time i missed crafty crows because i was in scotland for my sister's wedding i'm going to do two poems from then and this is a wedding poem. Uh, for me, it, it's rather nice. The wind set fair today, the lock is calm, a boat could cross its length, nay bother. The mist is high today, the cl cloud 
is far above the hill, the man could climb that Ben to see the sights and take a flask. And in the garden, though the rhododendrons passed, rich orchids sneak up through the grass, and this bodes well. I think it is auspicious to be married on a day like this, even if the deer are shy and the ospreys hang up high. There will be other days, of course, when clouds are low and rain comes in, but that's to be expected. Such day will, will pass. This day will be remembered. A good day to be married when hope hangs from the trees like pure air lichens. So that's a, a marriage. And after that, we went, because um, we had to go up to there, we went to Edinburgh um, for a few days. And um, among other things, we went to Greyfriars Graveyard, where um, Greyfriars Bobby, of course, is, is buried, the dog who looked after his master. And um, also uh, Willie McGonagall, the great bad poet of, of Scotland. But as we were there, we went round the back and... There was a grave, and all these people were having their photos taken. So I said to this bloke, why are they having their photos taken? And he said, oh, it's the grave of Tom Riddell, you know, Voldemort. And I fell a few grades down. This poem is about that day, and it, it may upset some people. I just warn you of that now. Wandering round Greyfriars graveyard among the broken gravestones, wondering what it is that makes us so disturb the dead, I pass the flodden wall and find a line of metal barriers for crowd control. I cannot see the point, since even the monuments here are broken or eroded down. And then I find the grave of Thomas Riddell, and there's the queue to have their photo taken. I ask a man who's sitting on another grave, and he explains it's Voldemort from Harry Potter, which makes me wonder what the real Riddell must think about his name and station getting stolen by a two-bit villain from a second-rate book. <laughs> Leaving the sorry scene behind, I return past the church, which is closed for rehearsals, past Greyfriars Bobby's grave and his sexton friend. Note that Willie McGonagall is buried here somewhere, but we are too flagged to find him. As we cross the road, a man in a stupid cloak waves his wand, and the crowd, he's stripped of 16 pounds apiece, repeat his imbecilic chant. I wave my arms to mock his travesty, and they all laugh. But I'm uncertain whether they get the jibe. Disturbingly, they follow us towards the number three bus stop, and I think, come on, McGonagall, write some shite about these idiots. Come on, Bobby, bite their legs and make them hop round Edinburgh. Most of all, I think, Mr Riddell, Wait for them in their beds. Do your Walter Scott impersonation and scare the bejesus out of these brain-dead grave robbers. That's me. Thank you. And uh, apologies to <laughs> yeah, any fans of Harry to... Potter. <laughs> lovely to hear your your voice again and your poetry again. Thank you so much, Gerald Kells. It's interesting, isn't it? I personally did enjoy reading the books. I won't say they were as bad as you make out, but the stupidity of people that think of them as real, that's something different. <laughs> so big round of applause for Gerald Carroll. Okay, all right. Next up is Dawn Jutton. Dawn, yes. welcome. Thank you. Um, my first time at finally making one oh. of your... Sessions. Doubly welcome. And I'm having a lovely time, so thank you. And yes. thank you for letting me read. Um, two poems, one quick one, one longer one, just to explain a little quick background. Um, I'm the daughter of a serviceman and of an age when we were able to travel around as a family with my dad. So um, I never had this sense of home. Um, and then in the second poem, when we did come back to this country, 
we while we were being resettled that we'd stay with my grandparents in Stoke um, and the only bit of dialect my granddad ever taught me was cos kick a bow again a woe yet it back and bossed it um, so that that's inspired a poem and I actually should say I'm also a, a sort of dual practice fine artist as well and this poem actually appeared in an exhibition in Stoke recently but anyway on to the first one that explains a little bit more home I wear each house like a hand-me-down coat Loch winds and hill grass seep from the hem, salt water and seashells pool in its hood. Grit grey lining frays and my ill-fitting cuffs, mismatched buttons, almost without notice, slip from their threads, skitter into dust. Fingertips thrust deep into pockets, I pick at the stitches to let home out. Um, and the Koskika Bow is actually a poem in, it's called a poem in four halves. And this is the first half. Alf makes it home from his lunchtime stint before the gravy on his dinner has chance to form a skin. Gives his overworked lung a gasp of air from the dangling mask in easy reach of his fireside chair. Then sinks back open mouthed, and we whisper cross-legged by his sippers, leave him to snore through each grateful breath. When he splutters back to life, he shifts beer belly first to cushion edge practice to his shape and begins through toothless grin his old routine. Goss kick a bow again a woe, yet yeah, it back and bossed it. Between each repeat, without translation, he leaves a gap for us to roll the words around mouths greedy for belonging. Goss kick a bow again a woe, yet yeah, it back and bossed it. Echoes with each kick against the outhouse wall. We argue where his other lung has gone. Lost to a bullet in the war, he'd said. Lost down the pit, Kathleen said, over biscuits dunked in sterilised milk. We beg her to unlock the cabinet door, turn each piece of china, the way she taught us, glide our daring fingertips over crinkled petals nestled in the wings of an iridescent swan. Ask again how she painted the flowers on her apprentice saucer, how long it took. She never remembers or complains. Just juggles pop bank kids an evening mass for half his wage. But Saturdays at 3pm, she kicks off her shoes on the strip of grass between privet hedges neatly trimmed, opens up a threadbare red striped deck chair, a potter's filled night souvenir from Landudno. There you go, that's me. Thank you very much. Oh, that, they were brilliant. I'm absolutely hooked. I was fascinated. Thank Can you. you give us a translation? Yeah, that's, yeah, I have to give you the translation. <laughs> that's like some people know what it means. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I obviously don't. So can you put it in the chat? <laughs> that was brilliant. Please unmute and give a big round of applause. Um, for Dawn Jutton and I do hope you'll come again. It's been brilliant having you. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. I will. Okay. Um, next up, uh, Beth Brook. Welcome, Beth. Oh, it's nice to be here. Thank you, Dawn. We share a childhood, army child, round the world. So, yeah, I, I that really resonated. Okay. Um, for reasons best known to myself, I decided I'd read you a poem about death followed by a poem about birth. Um, so here you go. Um, <laughs> slipping away. Tide ebbs, exposes the rocky shore and the stranded detritus of our voyage. The smell of the sea lingers like the memory of an evening enjoyed with friends in a room just out of reach, the eyes close and summoning voices are left to lead the way. Lungs forget their deepness. Breath becomes an intermittent breeze that gentles, gathers itself before it breathes again. Hands cool to the touch, tug and clutch, but cannot stop the retreat of water that once carried them, a bloom on amniotic seas from the place of their beginning. The mouth softens to a closing sigh, so quiet the watchers do not hear it go. And this one is a poem that um, I wrote it for a hedgehog competition where 
the idea was that you had to write the the wall notes, the gallery notes for a painting that doesn't exist, a painting that just exists in your head. Um, Hedgehog didn't like it, but anyway, I'm giving it to you. Um, it's called Unto Us, A Child Is Born. Unto us, a child is born. Triptych, egg tempera on oak panels. Traditional as a devotional aid, this triptych of the birth of Christ is represented in the modern idiom. Pregnancy test in Mary's hand, Joseph in running kit, offers the viewer a low key annunciation. In the central panel, the holy infant, delivered by Caesarean section, is handed to his mother by an angel in scrubs. In the final panel, the child is celebrated. A black and white cat sits beside the Moses basket. Worshippers bring food and tiny knitted cardigans take selfies to memorialize the nativity of hope. In the background, choirs of angels sing. Thank you. Fabulous. Well, I think that's Hedgehog's Loss and now again, and I've got that picture in my head completely of, jo of the angel in scrubs and, jo and Joseph in running, running gear or something. <laughs> That's my son. It's about the birth of my grandson. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wonderful. Please unmute and give a big round of applause for Beth Brook. Okay. Next. Oh, <laughs> it's a bit too late, but that's brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> um, next up, we have Ivor Daniel. Welcome, Ivor. I think you're still muted, Ivor. Ivor, you're still muted. Yeah. Hi, thanks, folks. Thanks for your patience. Uh, I'm really enjoying all the poems and especially Sue's. Uh, I grew up in North Wales where Sue is, I think, and um, these, these two poems I'm going to read reference North Wales in different ways. The first one is called Cognition. I'm thinking about aluminium and a nuclear power station and how on a clear day you could see it all from Snowden. How spiral shavings curl from a metalworking lathe and fall to the floor thin as memories. And why I excavate some forgotten day or other as a spiralized zucchini and worry about my mother. And this one, my school holiday employment opportunity at Bristatin Pontins. To say it was a prison camp with bingo would be unkind to Pristatin Pontins. For me, it was more of a chance to see the world from the other side of that nine foot fence. Our job description, had we been given one, was to get the holiday camp ready for the summer season. Touching up the paintwork, picking up litter, moaning that the chorus girls had not yet been recruited. It may sound easy, but some of those cigarette butts were embedded in the grass like rivets, stuck fast as a 1970s Welsh rugby defence, back when our fullback looked like Jesus. Some of that soil is still under my nails. Oh, Pontins, you're always a poor relation to Butlins. But I like to think I played my part. Perhaps you represented real life. Perhaps you helped me negotiate those teenage tides. 
Years later, I did feel sad when he fell into administration after hemorrhaging cash in the noughties recession. By then, your 1950s glamour had worn a bit too thin. Or was it that rabid episode of Watchdog that did you in? Thank you. That's brilliant, Ivor. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Um, that is a holiday camp like no other, I think. <laughs> riveted cigarette stubs riveted into the ground. Amazing. Thank you very much. Please unmute and a big round of applause for Ivor. Woo! Woo! You got a woo on your leg. <laughs> Uh, next up, we have Carlos the Unhappy. Welcome. Hello there. Um, I want to put a little thanks out to uh, Jason first. Um, I'm sure someone does this at every episode of Crafty Crows, but Jason's the guy that makes it happen every single month um, and for keep on keeping on. And I think uh, he deserves... Uh, all the applause he's going to get at the end of this one as well. But also, don't forget, he puts out Steel Jackdaw, uh, an eco arts and poetry magazine. Um, I just don't know how he has the time uh, and energy to keep doing this, but his advocacy of uh, writers and artists locally and beyond around the world even uh, is to be um, um, duly applauded. So thank you, Jason. Um, Right, I'm going to read, though, uh, something from my forthcoming second collection. The first one was Oblivion. The second one is called Flux. There's a bit of a theme running there. There'll probably be a third one, and then that'll probably be it for me, I think. Maybe in that series, I don't know. But anyway, the start of Flux has, I live in the Forest of Dean, and it has a 20-part long poem based in the Y Valley and Forest of Dean and perhaps up to a certain degree wider Gloucestershire. Anyway, but this one is part 10 and part 11. They're very short, so you'd be pleased to hear that. The first one is called Rain in the Dean, obviously the Forest of Dean, if you don't know. Uh, so part 10, Rain in the Dean. Sky purity of clear rain greens the grass, rests on moss strands tiny baubles of silvery light held held until the drop drip drips fall as if here have this star dew these dean trees have caught for you without even reaching that's the first one and the second one, part 11, is a little grave, a little grave. We dig a little grave about the size of a bread bin, about the size of a heavy medicine ball pumpkin dead, the depth of a severed head. Yet in the hole, place instead, carefully by its delicate, thin underfingers, a sapling tree, a new and fresh sapling tree, who instinctively reaches out simply to hold the soil and live. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Carlos. I love that last night to really reach out and live. Brilliant. Please unmute and give a round of applause for Carlos the Unhappy. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, next up, we have Ashley Edge. Welcome, Ashley. Good evening. Um, I've got two for you tonight because uh, neither are very long. So um, we're going to do. Neurodivergency is the subject matter for both poems. Um, and the first one is called Meltdown. 
I cannot confirm which me you'll get when my brain overfills and melts. There's three of me, at least I'd say, and all are awkward gits. I'll crackle or sizzle or turn to stone, but your guess is as good as mine. Sometimes there's warning my gut will kick me, my brain will whimper, my hands will stim. It gives me time to hide, breathe, relieve. It gives you time to brace. See, if I pop like champagne, it drowns you in spray, a tsunami of insults that cut to your bones. If I sizzle like bacon, my body contorts in net spine arching, neck spasming pain, renders you worried and helpless. If I'm rigid, unmoving, a petrification, an unblinking statue, please view me as Athena. I'm, I'm it's, uh, it's my internal war that's fighting my, I'm an internal warrior that's fighting my autistic war. Apologies, wrong edit. <laughs> Feels like ants are under my skin, crawling over my muscles, controlling every flail, whether twitch or punch. It feels like my brain is melting down my spine. Thank you. That is not the proper edit. <laughs> so apologies for the jumble there. That's been edited since then. Um, the next one is definitely the correct edit. And it's called ADHD, as in autism and ADHD. It inhabits my life with its inhibiting, erratic, eclectic manners, smothers me in uncertainty. What was fine last week knocks me out this time. No doctor, real or Google, can predict the cause of each burnout. Too much existence is too big a reason. Unsolvable, unlivable. Revival is removal of all things fun until my skin can breathe again. Survival honed from years of guessing wrong. Auditory, visual, tactile taste buds lead me down the path of overwhelm. Wail incoherent blame curled fetally, a twitching heap of human. Self-psychoanalysis to solve the riddles of the Sphinx as she whispers gleaming eyes. Venn diagram of neurodivergencies. I refuse to regret life missed from meltdowns, periods of spasms, staring into space, stuttering or silent, petrified or hyper. Life on the sidelines. Phoenix bursts of life keep me sane, fighting joyously despite the agony on eyes, tongue, ears as I navigate the obstacles of this electric life. Thank you. Brilliant, Ashley. Thank you. You express this so well that you are with you. <laughs> so fabulous. Please, big Round of applause, Ashley Edge. Um, next up, hold on, I've got a bit of a change here. We have Jason Conway. <laughs> Welcome, Jason. Thank you. Well, what a wonderful night and stunning set. So it's wonderful to hear you read. Um, so we've had a bit of loss and grief. Well, th this kind of has implied um, loss into it, uh, a loss of kind of nostalgia that I wasn't able to witness because I wasn't born in that period. Um, this poem is a hom homage to uh, Newcastle on the Lyme, my hometown in Staffordshire. And uh, the name the Lyme refers to the river and also a brook that runs through the town. And it's called Of Lyme and Lines. Rise now and go to where rail and canal once ran as rich veins of this town. Start at Lime Valley Park where Lime Brook still flows. Born of ancient river Trent, its waters like the industry that rushed timeless minerals to build community homes. Take a detour to station walks, nod to the ghost of Brampton Halt. Stamp your ticket at the tunnel where echoes lie in grass banks. No tracks 
just a gravel path. Meander down past Maybank to pool dams, lime lined pitches, meet the brook as it narrows, like the fading legacy of brick, tile, and limestone. Stop in Nutton to pay respect as rail bones rust and sleepers sink to dream below ground, as relics mark the lifelines that fed Apedale, Castle, Stoke, and country with coal, coke, and iron. Preserved in online archives, but shuttled by a castle lad too late for days of soot and sweat. Feel those lost vibrations that stoke a drifting headscape each time the lime calls, feet and eyes to trace history and heart to be its engine. Give thanks to the honest folk that built this working town and be flooded and proud. Thank you. Oh, brilliant. Brilliant, Jason. I just, there was a couple of lines I tried to grab, but the one that I caught was sleepers sink to dream below ground. I love that because the there is such a nostalgia over a, 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 an old railway line. It's And you were talking about the pits and everything, but brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Please, big round of applause for Jason. Yay. We have um, three people left now. Um, Alan Mansell, Alan, welcome. Are you there? Well, I didn't put myself down for open night, Mike or anything, but I could. I could didn't you? No, well, I got you on the list, so that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yep. Yeah, now I'm, it's the first. I normally do something. I've been doing a, a different thing on a Wednesday for years, but I do, I do normally uh, catch up on on this on on the uh, YouTube thing. I have I can dig a couple of things out if you want me to read read something. Um, um, if it's going to take you a while, can I come back to you? Yep. Yeah, yeah, I could. Brilliant. I'll, yep, I'll just grab uh, something out of there. Okay. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry that I was a little bit late from coffee, but I was just taking a, a call from my daughter. No, and, that's fine. And, I'm and pleased to have you here. From A and E, so that was oh, good. Oh gosh, yes. <laughs> um. Okay, we'll go straight on to Graham Brand. Graham. Hello. Good evening, all. Hi. Uh, Welcome. Hi. I've got two poems for you this evening. First one is called Divided Identity. <laughs> Divided Identity of my experience. Who I am against what is expected. Where am I going, not where I am? What will make me truly free? Breaking out the stereotype wall, put there in order to purely confine the person that you told me to be, not, not the person inside of me. Hey, so what the... No, you choose gender freedom for how I present in order to live. You do not decide for me, nor should you look, look to mark it out, the boundary of what I must accept. It was never really he or him, or, or even she slash her, but always ever they and them. There you go, that's the first one. And, and the second one that I've got is called, If It Is Fine. If it is fine not to be fine, when your head cannot face the day, why is there guilt about calling it out? Meaning that it makes sense, makes it so much worse. Guilt that a day cannot be taken, to take the time to put your head right, so that tomorrow could be better, to face the day and cope your way. Can it be fine not to be fine without that guilty complex? That all about will think and true when your mind is out of kilter. It must be fine not to be fine when all you want is better. Thank you. Thank you so much, Graham. Big round of applause for Graham. And yeah, we always say, I'm fine. <laughs> and we don't mean it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Um, and next up, Deirdre Ann Hines. Deirdre? Okay, Josephine. Thank you. Great evening. Welcome. Thank you very much. I'm loving everything as usual. I'm going to read a poem about that set in the river, a little tributary of the river Swilly, and that flows through my hometown. And Suliak is the name given the monster that is supposed to live there. 
It's called The Mysterious Case of Him. Of all the waters we could have chosen to scheme by, it was always Roger's burn that caught us diving with boys or fishing with worms pierced by bent nappy pins, sinking down into the silt of shoelace elastic line. That once hooked a piece of river gold we all wigged each other's hair to hold, insurance against the day we'd leg it out from this old damn time that never forgot or forgave a grudge since the waters retreated and left old Suliath behind as darkest of their imaginings. Man-eating monsters gave our games that extra edge, but all myth is more than a way through the stories of why we're here. The burn gave me riddle of name, and he was reborn from globlets of bramble, blackberry, rosehip, slow, fleshed and old alluvial, seasonally dressed. He was mine, I his, until running to water refracted a giantess back. But still what words make flesh continues as parallel, survives as echoings do, on bat pirouette along raveling ribboned light, as when liberationists freed the white chemicals, then rabbits from the science labs, I thought his hand had helped. Or once again, when strange lights brought back miracles at Roger's burn, I knew his mischief had helped. But geography is more than place, bigger than map, moving us like compasses wherever water falls. And although we all tried to step into the same river twice, we're denied replay. But waters have run through us since crawled from primordial seas. Still, the ship we made from an iron bed with crow's nest was our own ark, carrying us as celebrants into the future darknesses. Look closely at shadows cast by light. Know all monsters have as many ways of hiding as we had. Still, sing fantastically of his guardianing of these waters, this harvesting of mysteries in imagination's name. And I'm just, thank you. I'm just going to read um, a little bit. I have a new little book out for younger readers called The Marmelt, A Fable for Our Times. And I just, um, it's science fiction verse novella, a little fable, um, but cosmic, a lot of stars. And I just read a little bit from the inside. It's impossible to give. Anyway, it takes a long time to become young and even longer to stay that way, unless you can fly faster than blue bots zigzagging the skies. Earth is old now, even older since the nomenclatures became our rulers. Like every ruler ever made, only a certain number of numbers, 12 to be exact, can fit into their shaping of the world. I fitted into a word I saw and heard but could never bring myself to write, not wanting to give power to those with neither heart nor imagination. But if there is another one like me, this tale is map. They tell me my name was Anna back then. I don't remember, but my number is as clear as day. 25-03A. They taught us numbers, but only a few were taught how to describe. We were seditious. And everyone knows what happens when we seditious meet words. Anarchy, they said. Every word they did not like began with the letter A. There was Anastasia for one. She led a revolt far off in the Arctic wastes. And the image of her once graced every billboard before they tore them all down. She too had wings, raven black. They said she was a myth. They said she was made up. There was no such thing as humans who could fly. That was all barbarity. They said that all such thought and talk was wrong. They said they'd teach us how to think right. We were anomaly throwbacks, rejects, as out as stereo or radio. I lived with the others in the outer skirts. One day, I saw a picture of a dress from another age. It had skirt after skirt heaped one upon the other. Each one looked soft as spider silk, not like our outer skirt, old barn houses or regulation tent. Thanks. Ooh.
Fabulous. Thank you, Deirdre. I would really love to see that first poem on, you know, on the page. I really would, because there was so much richness, so much mythology, so much about water and monsters and things. But I, I grabbed a bit. Geography is bigger than maps. And then you went on to something else. I would really love to read it. It was fabulous. Big round of applause for Deirdre. Okay, Deirdre Ann Hines. And finally, we'll get back to Alan Mansell. Alan, have you found a poem? Yeah, I found two short ones. If, if Lovely. That was the, thing. Um, the first one, uh, it was interesting to hear uh, Jason read about his own area, Mines, the Black Country. And uh, there's a, often a debate as to what is the Black Country, um, whether it's just the areas on the traditional 30-foot uh, coal seam or not. Um, but um, uh, to, to, to me... Um, this was my thought about it one night, and it's called. Um, oh, sorry, I saw it. I re did retitle it at one time. Oh dear, bear with me. I do apologise. It's called the Crown of the Black Country. Garlanded at night by strings of phosphorescent pearls, Regal Rowley, a proud basaltic giant, your innards torn apart by resource-hungry man. You stand now disemboweled, but still defined. Explosive vultures daily pick your shattered carcass clean, ripping roadway flesh from your brittle bones. Yet your jeweled diadem still dominates the dark hours view from most black country homes. Um, Rowley Regis is the highest point in the black country. I think it's about 880 foot above sea level and was at one time two great quarries and a very narrow uh, piece of land with a, a, a little road that went went across it. And I went across it one day and uh, I've just not been there for some years and it was uh, quite an eye-opener from something you looked at. Um, and the other one is just... Um, it is something that was in um, Fleet Arts Belper Poetry thing this year, um, uh, which after we've had seen so much misery on our screens and perhaps the what I believe is the wettest um, 18 month period in 150 years. Uh, this is Climate Thoughts from Grasmere, Spring 2024. I scudded one of dark grey crowd that wept tear veils o'er northern hills, clouded vistas in a stair rod shroud, mud mess devoid of daffodils, bulbs golden promise congealing jellies, our madness clings to walkers wellies. I love it. Thank you. I love the re reference to the daffodil words with daffodils. Yeah, brilliant. Please, a round of applause um, for Alan Marsh Marshall. You. Mansell, sorry, Mansell. Can't read my writing. And that brings us to the end of this wonderful class, Crafty Crows. I've thoroughly enjoyed myself and I hope you all have. Please, can we have a round of applause again for Sue Finch and her wonderful set it was brilliant. <laughs> And also a round of applause for our second set of uh, open micers. Brilliant, brilliant poem. Really great quality. I love everyone. And of course to Jason for, as they've all said, keeping it going. <laughs> and it's quite a heavy burden at times, I must admit, when, when, when personal things are going on and you, you, you know. So it's brilliant that you've kept it going. Absolutely fabulous. I've loved being here um, again and... Good night to everybody and all the very best. Thank you. Thanks, Josephine.